Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you, and it's a, it's a privilege to meet together on, uh, on this special evening. It's a special mm-hmm. night. It is um, a night that uh, we ought not forget. It's, it's something we mark every single year as Protestants, as, uh, as Reformed Christians, and uh, it has great significance for us. Reformation Day is what we call this day. In fact, that's what uh, I want to look at, is to consider... Reformation Day. What is Reformation Day? It is based off of the Reformation. And that's what I want to look at this evening. As the world celebrates Halloween, we see, what do we see around us? We see something that has uh, demonic undertones to it and a a dark undertone to it. Uh, We could even use the term satanic to describe some of the things that we observe our neighbors, even close friends, Doing and engaging in on, on this evening, on this night. Uh, we see costumes and decorations, haunted trails and things of the like that worship death, that exalt death and exalt demons and devils. And they call this holiday what? They call it Halloween. Halloween. And it's interesting that the word Halloween is derived from the term All Hallows Eve. And the word hallow, those of you who like your King James Bible, means holy, All Holy Eve. And it's the eve of what, specifically? It's the, it's the day before a, a very important Christian holiday, and that is All Saints Day. November 1st is All Saints Day. And so we have October 31st, the last month of October, and November 1st, both significantly uh, important Christian holidays. But it's only been in recent years that we've observed um, a secularization of October 31st, of being taken from something that was historically used to, to, to worship God and to realize the importance of, um, of, um, of the day after, which had been All Saints Day. Now it's been taken and turned to what it is, as I mentioned. Uh, and All Saints Day is merely a celebration on November 1st. A celebration of Christians throughout all the ages, and even in fact modern Christians today. We celebrate the fact that God has kept a people for Himself throughout all history. And He has used men and women throughout all history to, uh, to accomplish His purposes. In fact, this has been celebrated. Uh, all Saints Day is a practice going all the way back to the 8th century. On, on November 1st. So this isn't something new. This isn't something that's uh, even in our modern era. This goes back to ancient times. And so therefore, October 31st had great significant uh, meaning, had important meaning to Christians uh, for, eight, for the ages, for, for quite a long time. But something else took place on October 31st, just in recent history. In fact, if you look at the history of the world, the Protestant Reformation was something that happened recently. It happened about five centuries ago on October 31st, and that would be October 31st, 1517. We have an event where a a German monk, a German uh, Catholic who went to a a church in Germany, nailed his 95 theses, which is a statement on uh, his disagreement with the Roman Catholic Church. And when he hid those nails, when he, when he nailed that, um, that piece of literature to that door, uh, we could look at it like this. The entire world shook because it changed. I was t- talking with my grandfather on the way here how that changed the world. It really did. And we can see its effect even to this very day. It's really amazing. So I want us to consider that. I want us to consider that reformation that took place by that simple act and what followed and even what, became, uh, what came before that as well. And so that's what we're going to consider tonight briefly. Now, before we do that, of course, we need to think about the context of this. What, what was life like in, modern, in Martin Luther's day? This, this German monk, this simple man. What, what, what was the world looking like 500 years ago in the, in the early part of the 1500s? Well, for one, Europe was impoverished. Europe was, was uh, stricken with poverty you know, throughout many different nations. And uh, specifically where Luther lived, it was prevalent in Germany. You had a lot of people who lived the life of what we would use the term peasant. They, that, that was a huge, uh, huge thing that was there in Europe. The economy was not doing very good at all. And you can trace this and you can see its connection to the oppression of the Roman Catholic Church. It's hard for us to think about, especially being in America today, but the Roman Catholic Church in Luther's day was closely connected with governments in Europe. In fact, it was very political, and they had uh, direct control over governments in Europe. It was, And it wasn't good control. It wasn't even for a positive influence. We know, actually, 
that a good term we could use to describe the Roman Catholic Church's influence on Europe would be oppressive. It was oppressive. Very much so. And it had grown worse over the Dark Ages. That would have been that period of history before Martin Luther's day. It had grown terribly worse. Because there was a time when uh, the Roman Catholic Church actually held to a lot of dear doctrines. Especially uh, in the later portion of the early church. We have uh, bishops and some of those concepts that are, that are further taken along later on in history by the Roman Catholic Church. Being brought to our attention. And they, they, were, they were pretty solid. But as time went on. As the Dark Ages came along. They're, they're called the Dark Ages for a reason. They really are. And we find that the Roman Catholic Church began to become corrupted. It began to become very much corruptive. In fact, we know around uh, 1000 AD, we have what's called the East-West Schism, which is where the church actually splits East and West. They had great disagreements on uh, some key ideas there. So really we could say church politics ruled Europe. We could say that, uh, that the Roman Catholic Church was like a tyrant. It was tyrannical. And there were many heresies taught by the Roman Catholic Church, many falsehoods. Uh, one of them being, and this is probably the most important, I think, is that they rejected the Bible as the sole authority when it came to matters of faith. They believed that the Roman Catholic Church and their interpretation of Scripture held the same weight. That, that, that uh, you, you, the Bible itself was not sufficient. You needed church tradition and you needed officially licensed clergy by the R- Roman Catholic Church to, to tell you what that, that truth of Scripture meant and what it really was. And uh, of course we can see how this would be destructive. Because really it didn't matter what you actually plainly saw in Scripture. It was about what the Roman Catholic Church told you was there in Scripture. And because of this, they actually held back the Bible from the common man. Really, that's one of the the, the sad things we see, especially before Martin Luther's day, was that the normal um, person, the, the, the average person in Europe had no access to the Bible, had no immediate access to the Bible. They had that, even though it was all over the place. It was in their churches. Because one, they didn't believe that you could interpret, you could actually translate the Bible into the modern languages. They actually only, the only Bible they had access to uh, before, actually before uh, Wycliffe's day, was the Latin Vulgate, which is in Latin. You had to be educated to do that. And we know what? These people are, are peasants. They have no education. They barely read. They barely read their own languages. And so it was, it was sad, actually, because you have these high clergymen, these priests and these bishops, holding back the truth of the Word of God from the people. In fact, uh, we see one of the practices that was common in that day was actually that they would have the whole service in Latin. The whole service in Latin. So you imagine being a Christian in Germany, going to church, and you not understanding a single bit of it. It's sad. It really is. And of course, with that, they could really make up whatever they wanted. They could say whatever they wanted about the Bible. And so we have things like, for example, rejection of salvation by grace alone. They believed that salvation was earned through a process of works. It was earned through a process of religious duty and religious activity. And interestingly enough, we find a lot of that's connected to what? The Roman Catholic Church. Because there's also a lust for power going on. They want the people to be enslaved in a system of work salvation, but one that requires for them to work under what authority? The Roman Catholic Church. So there was a lust for power. There was lust for money. There was lust for resource. One of the things that was very prevalent in Martin Luther's day was the purchasing of what we would call indulgences, which was actually basically you would buy a piece of paper and it told you you had forgiveness of sin that you'd committed. And it was a great revenue generator. It was a brilliant idea in the the sense of making money. But you think, what a dreadfully disrespectful and blasphemous act. Who can dispense forgiveness? We know that. It's God. God dispenses forgiveness. Not a man, not not, not, not a, a group of men, not a church. And certainly that forgiveness is not earned by money. It's earned by blood. And Christ already paid that in full on Calvary's cross. And so with that, of course, we find a belittling of the cross. We find a belittling of Christ. It's really sad. Christianity had become so warped, it it barely appeared to be what it was originally. So Europe was in a mess, we could say. It, It was a dark time. Very dark time. Dark spiritually, dark economically. It was dark. But before Luther's time, God had actually sent men before him. God had actually sent men ahead of Luther to do a lot of what Luther would also do. One man was the name of, uh, a man by the name of John Wycliffe. You know, we all are probably familiar with John Wycliffe. And uh, interestingly enough, I didn't know John Wycliffe lived so far back as he did, but he was born in uh, thir- the 1320s. Really early. And this is, this is uh, quite some time before Luther was even born. 
And uh, one of the things that Wycliffe held to, being a, a reformer, he believed that the Roman Catholic Church had uh, greatly strayed from what they were originally. And he believed one of the things that he really held to was that they ought not hold the Bible away from the common man, but rather they ought to translate the Old Testament and the New Testament scriptures into the modern English tongue. And um, John Wycliffe, being an Englishman, translated the Latin Vulgate. He actually translated it out of Latin into Middle English and um, was persecuted for that by the Roman Catholic Church. Another gentleman after Wycliffe's time was a man by the name of John Huss. John Huss was a mighty man of faith and likewise was a reformer. And he held to the truth of Scripture with diligence and he was involved in the Roman Catholic Church. What's interesting to think about is these men weren't outside of the Roman Catholic Church saying, oh, you got this wrong. They were actually men who came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And even at a time said, we believe that the Roman Catholic Church can be changed and we are going to try to stay in it. But they began quickly to see that that was not going to happen. And even to this day, what do we find? Roman Catholic Church hasn't changed. It's just gotten worse. It's gotten worse. But John Huss, like I said, was a man who was principled. He, he greatly uh, preached and taught against things like indulgences and uh, things like salvation by works and things of the like. He agreed with John Wycliffe. He was a huge fan of John Wycliffe's teaching. And he was born in about 1380s. I think it was 1384. But he was one of the first men who was burned at the stake for his faith. John Huss was one of the first men who was burned at the stake. And what's amazing is um, he told those who were persecuting him. His name, John, meant... Uh, it's not John. That's more of an English transliteration. It's like Jan, Johannan. And it actually meant uh, uh, geese or goose. And uh, when he was being burned at the stake, he said, You can cook this geese, but in a hundred years God will raise up a swan that will evade your grasp. And we know what happened... And he was, he was killed in 1415. Guess what happened? 102 years later, 1517, God raised up a man by the name of Martin Luther. And it's amazing how providential his statement was that God would, would raise up a man like Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a brilliant man. He, he, he had a very difficult upbringing, but he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And um, though he had actually lived an ungodly life at... Um, at an interesting point in his life, he was, uh, he was outside somewhere, and I forgot where he was at, but a lightning bolt came down and struck the ground near him, and he thought, oh, I could have died. And he was struck, he was struck with the, with the reality of life and death, and struck with the reality that he is a mortal man, and that he's going to die and stand before God, and he became convicted, he became convicted over his sin. And so, um, for the next few years of his life, he dedicated his life to religious activity. He became a monk in the Roman Catholic Church. And he was scrupulous. He was dedicated to earning his salvation before God by works. And he always, always, always at the end of the day never felt satisfied with his work. Never felt like it was enough. Um, he was, he, I mean, I, I recall even reading stories about he would go out and pray in the snow in the wintertime. And this is Germany, so it's really cold. With no clothes on in the snow to further make the situation difficult to, to you could say, elevate his, his level of piety and his level of dedication to God. In fact, he said later on, later in life, he said, I, much of what I did in my youth, in my re- religious activity, actually gave him a lot of health problems later on in life because he pushed himself so far and would fast and would pray and would study. But he's brilliant, but he could not, he could not reconcile how a sinner like himself could stand before a holy God. And that's, that's the great dilemma of all mankind. How can we stand before God in and of ourselves? Anyways, later on he became a professor of Bible. He taught theology. This man knew the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and he actually began to form his own opinions about some things. He began to disagree. And so we find in, while still being an unbeliever, while still being unconverted, he took a, a piece of a, a document that he had written up, his 95 theses, which are 95 statements about things that the Roman Catholic Church taught that he believed to be wrong, And he nailed those, that that document, to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, which which was a statement. uh, We could think of the church door back in the day as like a bulletin board, a community bulletin board. Maybe like a Facebook post almost, you know, for our modern day. But something even more grand. And it, it gathered the attention of the community, of the nation, of the very world. It was like, I mentioned, Europe had been shaken. The whole world had been shaken. It, something had happened by this one goofball little monk. He, he, had sh- he, had, he had hit a chord, even though men had come before him. There's something about, something about what he did that changed the face of the earth itself. And, and truly, it, it did. Um, and from there, we have 
And that, that's, that's the day that we mark as the Protestant Reformation it exploded. From then on, we have men and women who began to study the Bible for themselves. And all of Europe was changed. Society was changed. And we'll see that in a moment. But it wasn't until two years later that Martin Luther was converted himself in 1519. When, as a professor, he stumbled upon a passage in Romans. And we've all, we're all familiar with it. Romans 1.16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation. Uh, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But then verse 17 he says, For in it, that's the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And uh, Martin Luther was vexed in his soul about verse 17 specifically, he, about the righteous man. How can he become the righteous man? How can he find himself fitting into that category before God? How can God see him as righteous? And he found consolation in the fact that it says, the righteous man shall live by faith. And in the fact that that verse there for the term righteousness in the Greek isn't a person who is actually righteous, but rather it is someone who is regarded as righteous, who is treated as righteous, who is credited with righteousness, as we see in Romans 4, when Paul speaks of Abraham. He knew, he understood then that, wait a second, righteousness before God is not something I earn, but it's something God treats me as something God gives me as a gift It's something God gifts me in his son and he said and it was at that moment I was born again of the Holy Ghost and he said that it was as if the gates of heaven swung open it's incredible and so the man went on to live a, an amazing life wrote a lot of works a lot of books and taught a lot and got married and raised up a family the Lord greatly blessed him and after his time, and, or I should say contemporaries with him, were men like John Calvin. John Calvin was another great reformer, great preacher. Another man was uh, uh, Zwingli. That was another gentleman in his day. And this Protestant Reformation actually continued all the way into the 1600s. You know, th- this wasn't something that just happened over, oh, this is a year's trend. This, this spanned two centuries. It, it touched into two different centuries And in the midst of all this, we have strong persecution happening. Protestants being burned at the stake. Protestants losing jobs, losing land, losing family members, losing reputations. And during this movement, all the Protestants started to gather under five phrases, under five mantras, under five statements that they said, okay, all of us who protest, that's what the word Protestant means, someone who's protesting, they're protesting the Roman Catholic Church. They said, "Let's, let's gather ourselves under five terms. And so that's where we get the Latin, the five Latin terms or uh, phrases, the five solas, which is uh, sola gratia, sola fide, solas Christus, so, uh, sola scriptura, and sola deo gloria. We find the, these, and they all, they all indicate what we as Christians believe, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And amazingly, uh, the Roman Catholic Church denies and disagrees with all of these and that's, that's, that's a great grievous uh, fact that we have to deal with even in this day. That our Catholic friends disagree with these precious points. These basic truths of our faith. These aren't side issues. This is, this is the very faith. This is the very Christian faith. The essence of our faith. The essence of what our Lord Christ died for. And so what was the result? What was the result of this? As I mentioned Europe has changed. This was the greatest. The Protestant Reformation was the greatest revival in all of church history. There have been revivals that God has blessed mankind with. We've seen them in America. We've, we've uh, seen them in Europe. Uh, we saw one, for example, in Acts 2 at Pentecost. We, we've even seen them in the Old Testament. There was revivals amongst the Israelites. But in terms of the, the amount of uh, the, the effect that it had outside of a revival that happened in Scripture... Uh, in terms of the effect, in terms of the, in terms of the fact that it changed all facets of life, the Protestant Reformation is the greatest revival that has ever taken place. And that's why, I, I, you may have heard me already say this, revival is reformation and re- reformation is revival. They're the same thing. When we pray for revival and we're shoals, and, and in this church we're praying for reformation, to reform the way that we think about God, the way the things that we believe concerning God, the way things that we believe concerning Scripture. And where does that reformation come from? It comes from the Bible. That's one of the things that all of the Protestants recognized was that all, even all five solas, guess where they all come from? Sola Scriptura. 
Everything that we know about God, about salvation, about spiritual matters comes from what the Bible discloses to us. It all comes from the Word of God. Really, we could say the Protestant Reformation was a reclaiming of the Bible that had been locked away, that had been held away from the people. In fact, by the 1600s, we find in places like Scotland, it was recorded that uh, in every home you will find a copy of the Scriptures. Every home. Because people understood. People understood that the Bible, the Word of God, is, uh, we could say that it is the, the very epicenter of civilization itself. Not just in spiritual matters, but law, but government, judicial systems, economies, etc. It's hard to estimate the results of the Protestant Reformation because we can owe the birth of America from it, uh, to it. We can owe the very nature of the way Europe is even to this day. I mean, Europe's very prosperous. Very wealthy, very developed. And you know what? If, they, if, this if this had not happened, they would still be in the Dark Ages. They'd still be under the, the, under the oppression that they were under. The world was changed. And Europe was the world. Back in that day, Europe was the world. We had a large population in India and China, but they were so far behind. Europe was, in terms of, in terms of comparing the two, Europe was far developed in comparison to the others. And even Africa, you have a large population of people there in South America. But Europe was the center of the world. The center of arts, the center of literature, the center of music. It's the center of society, really. And we have all of it changed because of this one act of God through these various men and these various women. I mean, I just got a video from Travis earlier this afternoon talking about Martin Luther's wife and the effect that she had on economy. And, and the biblical principles she enacted, even in her own family life, and how that affected others. And they went and taught that to others and to others and to others on how this is how you do business. This is how you, this is how you have a capitalistic economy. Because the Bible uh, clearly teaches those concepts. Education was changed. People before the Protestant Reformation were illiterate. They could barely read. And we have after that, people are desiring to study. We have translators being raised up, people who know multiple languages. We have universities being founded. Education itself has changed, and we find that even in America today, we have a high value on education. And rightly so, because God calls us to use our minds. God calls us to teach ourselves things. Family life was changed as well, government. And even out of the Protestant Reformation, we have all these different denominations we have today. So we have like Presbyterians, Lutherans, Baptists, Episcopalians. We all can trace our, our, our heritage back to that great act. And we as Reformed Christians especially, as, as, as Calvinists, we can use you know, the term that uh, is dubbed after John Calvin's last name, have a great heritage as well. And we can trace that all the way back to there. And from these men, from their teaching, we find other men being raised up by God. Men like Benjamin Keach, John Gill, John Owen, John Flavel, a lot of Johns, Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, J.C. Ryle, and even all the way up to our very modern day, men like John MacArthur, who are even somewhat in that strain. God worked. God and it is still working. Still, we, f- we feel the ripples of the splash of the Protestant Reformation all around the world to this day. And so let us, brethren, praise God. Praise God for what He did in history. Praise God for what He did in the Reformation. Let us reclaim this holiday, as it were, this time of the year, to recall, um, to remember. This is something we need to tell ourselves every year, these facts that I've, I've just disclosed to you. Remind ourselves, because this is so important and so crucial for us as Christians. It is a gift. The Protestant Reformation was a gift from heaven itself. It was like, it truly was like God had dispensed these things right from His very throne room. God used men, God used women, God used children as conduits for His truth. God used Martin Luther as a conduit for His truth. And it was the truth that changed everything. I want to give one passage of Scripture in closing. And this is from the mouth of our Lord Jesus. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. There is something about the truth itself. In its very essence has such power to change and to over- overcome lives and to change societies and cultures, to change the world itself. It's like a lion. We, we merely need to just let it out of its cage and it'll do the work for itself. We don't have to make it. And Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Huss. And Whitfield, they understood this. They didn't go to their deaths 
as failures. They knew this. The truth, the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the Gospel is what will change the world. And we do not have to worry, as it were, about uh, whether we've done it right or wrong because God is the one who is working through that truth. Luther said, and you can always picture him at the end of his life saying this, because he actually was very famous, very famous. He got fame like that overnight from that. He said this, he said, it's a very simple quote, I did nothing. The Word did everything. The truth did everything. And it's that truth that we believe today, and it's that truth that we hold dear to, and it's that truth that we believe and we proclaim. And I can make application here in Ware Shoals. If God is pleased to change this town in maybe a small way or a large way by His truth, we can say with the With the great reformer, we did nothing. And the truth, the word of God, the truth of the word of God, the atom bomb of the word changed this community to the glory of God. So we are always in need of reformation. In fact, there's one more phrase I want to leave you off with. It's a Latin phrase. Semper reformanda. Semper reformanda. Some of you maybe caught familiarity with that with semper fi. Semper reformanda means always reforming. That's one of the Protestant... Uh, mantras. We, we don't believe what these men taught because they taught it. I don't believe what Luther and Calvin taught because Luther and Calvin taught it. If I read what they wrote and I believe it, it's not because they said it. It's because the Word of God said it. And they're, they're repeating it. They're echoing it, you could say. And the Protestants understood this and they told their followers, only believe what, what the Word of God is telling you. Don't believe what we tell you. And in fact, if we tell you something and you don't see it lining up with Scripture, reform it. Change it. And there's that phrase, semper reformanda. So us today, we must hold to the Scripture, we must study the Scripture, we must know the Scripture, so that we ourselves are always reforming to the glory of God. Let's close in a word of prayer, and I'd encourage you to continue fellowshipping uh, after this time. And enjoy some of the desserts. I haven't even had a chance to really get much of the desserts uh, yet. So let's pray. Oh God, I just thank you for the work that you've done in history. I think about Luther and I think about Huss and uh, Wycliffe and Tyndale and Zwingli and Calvin and so many of the other men. They're nobodies. They were nobodies. And they're dead today. And largely they're, they're, in terms of the secular world, their heritage has been forgotten, Father. And I know that these men wouldn't care as long as the fame of Christ is what is remembered. As long as the glory of Christ is what is, is what is recalled. And Father, we can trace and see their effect on society even to our very day and how they have been used by You to change this world. And we're so grateful. We're so grateful that You used these men. That You brought about this great work in history to save us from the, the horrible, the despicable whore of Babylon, the, the Roman Catholic Church, the the lies and the heresies that are taught therein, the the slavery that people are sold into when they're under that system of works righteousness. We're thankful, Father, that the truth has set us free. We pray that tonight we would remember these things, we would glorify You because of these things, that we would delight in Christ and rest in Him as Martin Luther did. As he himself said, it was... Not his own righteousness that would justify him, but the righteousness of another. He wrote that justitia alienum, that foreign righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, that he could that he could know, that he could trust in, to be sufficient before your throne. And so we're thankful for Christ, our Redeemer, and that we are saved by His grace, through faith, in Him alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And so we say, sola Deo Gloria. Amen. Amen.